<laughs> to God be the glory. It's a beautiful Sabbath day. Amen. Amen. We're so thankful to be here in the house of God for another blessed Sabbath morning. You know, God is really, I know it, we keep saying it over and over again, but it's so true. God is good. Amen. I mean, he's so merciful to us, you know, that we don't even deserve it. But thanks be to God. And I would like to welcome each and every one of you who are joining us and viewing us online. Welcome to another blessed Sabbath day here at Remnant Mission Church. Amen. We are continuing our study. Um, can, can I get the... Yes. Uh -huh. We're continuing our, our study looking at prophecy. We've been going through the book of Daniel. Amen. Last week we looked at Daniel chapter 7. Um, the week before that, we looked at Daniel chapter 2, dealing with Nebuchadnezzar's dream. And as I said so often, that dream, um, we are still living out that dream. Uh, that dream has not yet reached its full fulfillment yet. Um, so, but as we look at that particular dream, uh, that dream begins in Daniel chapter 2, but then it's expanded upon. As we get to Daniel chapter 7, more information is given. As we get to Daniel chapter 8, which we're going to be looking at this morning, more information is given. And then finally in Daniel chapter 11, great detail is given regarding uh, that particular dream. So um, we're going to go ahead and get started with a word of prayer. We're going to get our um, visual aid up here. As we look at the book of Daniel. Amen. All right. Thank you. Okay. So let's begin with a word of prayer. As we look into the word of God. Let us pray. Father in heaven, thank you so much for our blessing us to be assembled in thy house of worship on this blessed Sabbath day. And Lord, we ask for us of forgiveness of sin that you would cleanse our hearts, that you would forgive us, that you would... Um, remove every stain of sin that is within our hearts. Cleanse us through the precious blood of Jesus. And now we pray, we ask for the Holy Spirit. As you said that you are more willing to give us the Holy Spirit, then earthly parents are willing to give good gifts unto their children. So now, Lord, we ask for your Holy Spirit to be the teacher, to be the guide as we look into your holy word. Reveal these truths unto us, make them plain and simple that we all may understand. We pray this prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. I invite you to get your Bibles at hand. As I said, we're going to be looking at the book of Daniel, the 8th chapter. Daniel, the 8th chapter. And the title of this particular lesson study, as it is, in Bible readings for the home is entitled the vicar of Christ Amen. the vicar of Christ now you know in Daniel chapter 7 last week we were looking at the little home power amen, amen. how he should uh, speak great words against the most high okay and we identify this little home power last week as none other than the man of sin, the papacy. Amen? Amen. Amen. So as we look at this particular lesson study, which is entitled The Vicar of Christ, you know, this is one of his titles. The papacy calls himself the vicar of Christ. Now, now, now what, what, what does that word mean, vicar? Does Christ need a vicar? <laughs> Mr. Representative. <laughs> the, that word vicar means, you know, in the place of someone. Amen. Vicarious. Okay, that's another title. But, but, but it means in the place of someone. Mm -hmm. So basically, the, the, the Roman papacy is, is saying that he stands in the place of God on earth. Amen. Amen. That's, that's, that's his claim. And he, he, you know, he says that. <laughs> now, um, I just want to make this point perfectly clear. And I'm going to kind of lay a foundation before we actually get into the book of Daniel chapter 8. Um, when you look at, 
you know, just everything that's, that's taking place in the world. You know, when you look at the, the mass atrocities that are taking place, even things that happened this week, you know, the, uh, uh, the bloodless killings, the just every, all the species of evil that takes place in the world. And then when we look at this, you know, just so many, and let me just say this, a lot of the, the violence that takes place is in the name of religion. So why is there? My question is, why is there so much confusion over religion that leads to violence, that leads to atrocities, that leads to persecuting people? Why is there, you know, if, if, if God is love and there's only one God, then why is there so much confrontation over godly things? It is because of the adversary of souls. He wants to be God and he wants to uh, uh, give the, the gospel a bad rap. Amen. Amen. Turn with me to Revelation chapter 12 because I want to lay this foundation. And, and everything has to be viewed in terms of, as Brother Ingram said, this basically what it is, this controversy uh, between the powers of evil and the powers of good between Satan and between Christ. And in order to understand something, as it always is often the case, we have to get back to the beginning. You know, we're, when, you know, when we're born and we come into the world, we, we come into this. This is all we know. In other words, we tend to expect it because it's so common to see mass atrocities take place. It's, It, it doesn't move us anymore. You know, when a leaf fell in the Garden of Eden after sin, Adam and Eve were struck. They never saw that before. The falling of a leaf implies death. So we are so numb to killings and thing, bad things happening to where we're born into this. This is all we know. And really, most people, they don't know that there's anything better. So let's turn to Revelation chapter 12. Let's find out in the beginning, why do we have all of this taking place in our world today? Why are we seeing all of this? Revelation chapter 12. I'm going to kind of lay this foundation because the rest of this whole book of, uh, the book of prophecy, Daniel and Revelation, it all hinges upon this particular point. And unless we understand what we see happening, why it's happening, a lot of this really, we can't put it into uh, a proper place. Amen? So Daniel, uh, Revelation chapter 12, beginning at verse 7. Very familiar text here of scripture. Here it says, and there was what? War, war where? <laughs> Now let's pause. How can there be war in heaven? Heaven, a place where there's no sin. Heaven, a place where there's perfect peace and tranquility. But yet here the Bible says that war broke out in heaven. Why? Why did war break out in heaven? Let's keep reading. We're going to discover why. And there was war in heaven. Michael, who's Michael? Jesus Christ. Michael, the archangel. Michael, Christ, and his angels... What's that next word? Fought. What does it mean to fight when you're fighting someone? There is a war, but there is also a struggle, a, a physical struggle, right? Notice, get the picture. This is taking place in where? In heaven. There's fighting taking place. Michael, Christ, fighting against the dragon. Who's the dragon? The dragon, Satan, fighting with his angels. And look at verse 8. And they, the dragon and his angels, prevailed not, neither was their place found any more in heaven. And that great dragon was cast out. That old serpent called the devil and Satan, 
which deceived the whole world. He was cast out into the earth and his angels were cast out with him. Now, where was he cast? Where do you and I live? The earth. So where is Satan? Here with us, right? Amen. I want to just establish that point. Just because you don't see physically him does not mean that he's not here. This is spiritual warfare that we're talking about. Because we wrestle not against what? Flesh and blood, but against what? Spiritual powers, right? Can you see into the spiritual realm? No. So you can't see Satan, right? Physically, right? You can't see it. So we're fighting against a power that we can't see. How successful do you think you and I will be in that particular struggle? Just, just think about it. Just think if, if, if the United States goes to war with an enemy, but they can't see the enemy, but the enemy can see them, who do you think is going to win? The enemy. So we're wrestling not against a physical entity, but against a spiritual entity. But we can see the effects of the warfare, even though we can't see the participants, we can see the effects. So here it says that Satan was cast out, he and his angels, to the earth. And then let's drop our eyes down to verse 12. Therefore rejoice ye heavens, and ye that dwell in him. Now why are the heavens rejoicing? <laughs> Amen, because Satan is no longer there. That's why they're rejoicing. But what about the inhabitants of the earth? Are they rejoicing? What it says, let's keep reading. It says, but woe unto the inhabitants of the earth and of the sea, for the devil is come down unto you having great wrath, because he knoweth he had but a short time. So controversy broke out between Christ and Satan. Now, did that controversy end in heaven? No. Absolutely not. It began in heaven, and then since Satan is here, the controversy continues. So now we are participants in this great warfare, this great cosmic struggle between Christ and Satan, an enemy that we can't see. So we are participants in this struggle. Now let me ask you a question. Why did war break out in heaven? There had to be a reason. What's the reason? Say it again, Doc. Jealousy, which, which precipitated sin. <laughs> Lucifer was, was, was jealous of Jesus. Jealous, huh? Yeah. And, and it became a, a thing with him that he couldn't, it couldn't be reconciled. And the spirit of prophecy said God tried his best to reach Satan. Mm -hmm. you know, before, he, before the war got into a, a sure enough war, God tried to reach him to try to reconcile the situation. But he wouldn't listen. Jealousy. Jealousy on the part of Lucifer. Now, why was Lucifer jealous? You know, I was reading this morning, uh, mark this. This is taken from Early Writings. Powerful book, Early Writings. And the chapter is entitled, The Fall of Satan. Read that chapter. But in that particular chapter, in the very beginning, uh, the Spirit of the Lord says that when God said to Jesus, let us make man in our image, this caused the jealousy of Lucifer because he wanted to take part in that. And because of that, he hated Jesus because God said, let us make man in our image. So Satan was at the at the very inception of that. He was jealous of Jesus Christ. He wanted to be the one with the father because turn with me to Isaiah 14. We're going to see why. Turn with me to Isaiah chapter 14, beginning at verse 12. Isaiah 14, beginning at verse 12. Here it says, How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground which didst weaken the nations? Verse 13. For thou hast said in thy heart, I will ascend into heaven, I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. 
I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I, here it is, will be like the most high. This is Lucifer speaking here. Now, in, in verse 13, where Lucifer says, I will ascend into heaven. Let me ask you a question. Why did Luf Lucifer say, I will ascend into heaven? When he was already in heaven. What did he mean when he say, I will ascend into heaven? And he was in the heavenly courts when this thought arose into his mind. And we know he was in heaven because he was still identified by the term Lucifer. He, he didn't get Satan until he was cast out. That old serpent was cast out. That old serpent called the devil and Satan himself. So we know for a fact he was still in heaven. But he said, I will ascend into heaven. What did he mean by that? He meant that he was going to overthrow the creator. Okay, I like that. I like that. Turn with me to Romans chapter 10. We're going to get the answer. Romans chapter 10. I will ascend into heaven. Well, Lucifer, you're already in heaven. What do you mean when you say, I will ascend into heaven? Turn up. We're going to get the answer in Romans chapter 10. Mark this down because I think this is key, brothers and sisters. We have to understand. This struggle, this warfare, this controversy that began, why it began, in order for us to understand exactly what's going on when we see things happen. Romans chapter 10, beginning at verse 6. But the righteousness which is of faith, speaking on this wise, listen carefully, say not in thine heart, who shall ascend into heaven? Don't say that. Lucifer said it. But what does it mean? When you say that, keep reading, to say I will ascend into heaven, that is to bring Christ down from above. Lucifer wanted to take Jesus down off his throne. That's what he meant when he said, I will ascend into heaven. I'm going to sit on the side of the congregation of the north. You know, this is where Jesus sits. You know that, right? So Satan wants to take Christ down. And this struggle has been going on ever since war broke out in heaven. I will ascend. I'm going to take Jesus down. This is the struggle. This is the warfare that's going on. Now, something interesting about this. And again, I'm laying the foundation because we have to understand. Now, Lucifer... One thing that you have to understand, when you're fighting a war, you have to know something about your enemy in order to overtake them. One of the M.O.s of Satan, and write this down, I've said it so often, but it's true. Satan always uses a medium. Always. What did I say? What does that mean? What does it mean when I say that Satan always uses a medium or a vehicle? He never comes as he is. Mm -hmm. He uses a third party. He uses something else. He's behind the scenes, but he uses a vehicle, a medium. What happened in the Garden of Eden? What was the medium? Serpent. The serpent. The serpent. The serpent was the medium Satan used to, to beguile Eve and Adam. The serpent. So Satan always uses a medium. He didn't come to Eve just as he is. He doesn't come to you and I just as he is. He comes as an angel of light. He comes speaking truth, some truth. And therein lies the deceptive power of Satan. Because it sounds good. It may even look good and enticing, like the fruit did. But Satan always comes with some error. Always. Always. So he comes to, oh, he's preaching truth. You have to ask yourself, is he preaching all truth? To the law and to the testimony. If they speak not according to this word, it is because what? And if there's no light in them, there's what in them? What's the opposite of light? 
darkness. Who is the prince of darkness? Satan. So I just want you all to understand what's taking place, why it's taking place, the things we see happening. So if Satan always used a medium here in these last days, the little home power is Satan's medium. Amen? So now when you, when you start talking about Rome and the papacy, and we're gonna, we, we, we've been seeing where all of this sprang, sprung out of. Where did Satan, where did this medium come from? It came from Rome. It came from Rome. So brothers and sisters, I want us to understand what's taking place. Satan said, I will ascend into heaven. I'm going to take Jesus down. That's my goal. And to this day, he is, he is still working that same plan to take Christ down. Amen? Amen? So now anyone that names the name of Christ, i.e., you call yourself a Christian, Satan hates you. He hates Christians. He hates followers of Christ because he hates Christ. And if his followers are like Christ, he hates them as well. Do you all get the picture now? Okay, so now go with me one quickly to Ezekiel chapter 28. And then we're going to actually get into Daniel chapter 8. So let's go to Ezekiel 28. Ezekiel 28 speaks of Lucifer when God created Lucifer. Amen? Ah. I was looking for my water, but I wanted to bring out an illustration here. Um. Oh, thank you. Ezekiel chapter 28, beginning at verse 12. Listen to what it says here. Son of man, take up a limitation against the king of Tyrus and say unto him, Thus saith the Lord of God. Now here God is describing Satan in Ezekiel, I mean Lucifer in Ezekiel 28, verse 12. Thus saith the Lord God, Lucifer, thou sealest up the sum, full of wisdom, Perfect in beauty. That word, seal it up, the sum, in the original language, that simply means that there is an end. When you seal up something, there's an end. So let's take this bottle of water, for example. Let's say that this is Lucifer. When God created Lucifer, God poured into Lucifer all that Lucifer can hold. You all following me? Let's know what it says. Thou seal it up the sum, full of wisdom, perfect and beauty. So let's say if I take this water, bottle of water, and I drink some water out of it, and then I pour water back into it, I can only put back into this container what it can hold. This water holds, what is that, 16 fluid ounces. I can only put that back in, I can only pour into it what it can hold. Okay? God poured into Lucifer all that Lucifer can hold. Thou seal it up the sum. There is an end to what Lucifer can hold. Lucifer cannot hold all the fullness of God. <coughs> Do you all get that? Amen. Lucifer cannot hold all the fullness of God. So the Lucifer sealed up the sum. Lucifer could hold all that, only all that God could pour into him. Now, what made this so interesting and so intriguing to me because when you look at you and I, humanity, mankind, that's not so with mankind. Mankind, and I'm going to show you, mankind can hold all the fullness of God. Angels can't. That's how they were created. Turn with me quickly to Ephesians chapter 3. Let's look at this more closely here. Ephesians chapter 3. And this is why Satan is so 
hateful of you and I, mankind, humankind who reflect the image of God. Because he sees in you and I something that he can never attain to. Ephesians. As a matter of fact, before we go to Ephesians, let's go to Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 2. Hebrews chapter 2. This is a great controversy. You understand this, you will understand everything. Hebrews chapter 2, beginning at verse 6. But one in a certain place testifies, saying, what is man? Remember, this is the same that David spoke of in Psalm. Lord, what is man that you are so mindful of him? And when the son of man that you visiteth him. Verse 7, thou has made him a little lower than the angels. Thou has crowned him with glory and honor and did have set thy works of thy hands to him. So man was created a little lower than the angels. You know that word a little lower, a little, <laughs> a little lower, a little in the original language here. When you look up that a little, it means a little while. So when you read again, it sounds like this. Thou has made him a little while lower than the angels. And then if you read a little further, it says that Jesus Christ was made a little lower than the angels, a little while lower than the angels. What is Paul talking about here? This little while. Why are we a little while lower than the angels? And that is to suggest that at some point we will no longer be a little while lower than the angels. And if we won't be a little while lower than the angels, then we will be in a state that's higher than what the angels can attain to. This little while lower is because of sin. When Jesus was made a little lower than the angels, he left kingly heaven to come in sinful flesh. Because of sin, because of sinful flesh, we are a little lower than the angels for a while, just for a while. Now go to Ephesians chapter 4. Now let's go to Ephesians chapter 4. I mean, Ephesians chapter 3, I'm sorry. Ephesians chapter 3. Let's go to Ephesians chapter 3. Man is made a little while lower than the angels. Just for a little while. Ephesians chapter 3. Beginning at verse 14. Paul says, for this cause, I bow my knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, of whom the whole family in heaven and in earth is named. We have the name of Jesus. Remember, that's his glory. Amen. Verse 16, that he, Jesus Christ, would grant you, me and you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with might by his spirit in the inner man, that Christ, here we go, may dwell in your hearts by faith, that ye being rooted and grounded in love may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth, what is the length, what is the depth, what is the height, Verse 19, listen carefully. And to know the love of Christ, which passeth knowledge, here we go, that you, mankind, might be filled with how much of the fullness of God? Some of it? All the fullness of God. That's mankind's potential. If Christ reigns in your heart by the Holy Spirit, God's desire for you, for me, for mankind to be filled with all of his fullness. And not only that, here's a warm, marvelous promise. Go to Revelation chapter 3. Just think about that. You and I, God made us 
not only to reflect his glory and his character, but also to be deposited with all his fullness. Something that, that the angels can't even attend to. Because remember, Lucifer, you seal up the sum. I can only pour into you to Lucifer every, only what you can hold, but not so with mankind. Revelation chapter 3. Revelation chapter 3. Marvelous promise here. Look at verse 20. No, begin at, well, verse 21. Jesus here speaking. Revelation 3, 21. Listen at this. To him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I overcame and sat down with my father in his throne. So essentially Jesus is saying that whoever overcomes this world and sin by the power of the Holy Spirit, I'm going to grant you to sit with me in heaven in my throne. What a marvelous promise. Now, to sit with Jesus in his throne, that's in a state that not even the angels can attain to. You know why? Let's go back to Hebrews chapter 1. Hebrews chapter 1. The angels don't even have that capability of sitting with Jesus in his throne. But he's going to grant that to mankind who overcomes. Hebrews chapter 1. Hebrews chapter 1. Hebrews chapter 1, beginning at verse 13. Listen to what it says here. It asks the question. <clears throat> but to which of the angels <coughs> said he at any time, sit on my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool? You will never find it nowhere in the scripture where angels are allowed to sit with Jesus in his throne. As a matter of fact, the throne of Jesus is made up of what? Angels. <laughs> That's their lot. The throne of God, the throne of Jesus is made up of heavenly angels. And God is going to allow you and I who overcome to sit with him in his throne. That's something that the angels cannot attain to. And Lucifer knows that. Lucifer, you seal it up to some. There is an end to what I can put into you. I poured a whole lot of myself into you, Lucifer, but you can only hold so much. You cannot hold all the fullness of the Godhead. But not so with man. This is why Lucifer hates Jesus. This is why he hates you, mankind. Because we will attain to a position that he is looking to attain to. I will ascend. I want a throne. That's why we have this great controversy. Lucifer wants something that he can't get. He wants something that he cannot have. And in you and in me, he sees something that we can attain to that he can't. So that's why he's trying to do everything to prevent you to get what he wants. So this whole controversy, things that we see taking place today, the root cause of it is the great controversy between Christ and Satan. I want a throne because I want to be like the most high. I want to be worshipped like the most high. I want people to worship me as they worship God and Jesus. God has a church. I want a church. God has a day of worship. I'm going to have a day of worship. So I'm going to copy, emulate everything that I see God what he does, I'm going to do. Because God gets worship, I want that worship. That's why we see what's going on. That's why today, which is the seventh day Sabbath, most of the world knows nothing about the Sabbath. And you know why I'm going to read? This is going to be my last little statement here before we actually get into the lesson study. Listen at this, brothers and sisters. This is... Satan speaking. 
let's see if I can find it right quick here. This is taken from the book Maranatha. Of a great book, by the way, great devotional book. This is taken from the book of Mar Maranatha, and this is from June 3rd, which is entitled Satan's Groundwork for the Final Conflict. Maranatha, June 3rd. Listen to what it says here. This is Satan speaking here. Listen carefully. This is Luther. This is Satan speaking. I will work at cross purposes with God. I will empower my followers to set aside God's memorial, the seventh day Sabbath. Thus, I will show the world that the day sanctified and blessed by God has been changed. That day shall not live in the minds of the people. I will obliterate it from the memory of them. I will place in its stead a day that does not bear the credentials of God, a day that cannot be assigned between God and his people. I will lead those who accept this day to place upon it the sanctity that God placed upon the seventh day. Through my vicegerent, or through my vicar, or through the Roman papacy, however you want to say it, I will exalt myself. So Satan says, my medium is the vicar. My medium is the Roman papacy. Through my, through my vicegerent, I will exalt myself. Listen at this now. The first day will be extolled, and the Protestant world, now who, who are Protestants? What is a Protestant? Those who protest whom? No. Those who protest Those who protest the papacy. A Protestant is somebody who protests. Well, why were they why were the uh, Protestant protesting? Go back in history. Why were they protesting? They were protesting against the teachings of the Roman Catholic Church. That's why they left the old world to come over here. So a Protestant is one who protests Roman Catholicism. But listen, so listen to what he says here. Listen to what Satan says. I will exalt myself. The first day will be extolled, and the Protestant world will receive this spurious Sabbath as genuine. Do we see that happening? Who are the Protestants today? Who are some, who, who's supposed to be the Protestants today? Who were once the Protestants? Who were once the Protestants? Everyone who's not Roman Catholic was a Protestant. So your Baptists were pro are Protestants, supposed to be. Your Lutherans are Protestants. Church of God in Christ, Protestants. Everybody, every religion who is not a Roman Catholic was a Protestant. They were protesting against Rome and the papacy. So now I'm asking you a question today now, and you already, you already answered it. Who is the only Protestant church today? Who is the only Protestant church today? Amen. Amen. The only Protestant church today are those who, Jesus' church, who identify as those who what? Keep the commandments of God and what? Faith in Jesus. And have the testimony of Jesus with the spirit of prophecy. That, that's the only Protestant church today. So, if you are claiming to keep the commandments of God, and you are claiming to keep the testimony of Jesus with the spirit of prophecy, then you're a Protestant. You're still protesting Rome. You're still protesting this spurious Sabbath that Satan say he's going to extol. This spurious Sabbath is the first day of the week, Sunday worship. But unfortunately, un come on, Doc. Unfortunately, mm -hmm. unfortunately, we just can't say the Seventh Day Adventist. Right, I know. Yeah, we, yeah that's why I identified I Revelation 12:17. What's the true Protestant church? 
Those that keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus. That's the only Protestant church today. Exactly. So here he says, the first day will be extolled and the Protestant world will receive this spurious Sabbath as genuine. We see that taking place. Through the non-observance of the Sabbath that God instituted, I will bring his law into contempt. Now, why does Satan say he's going to bring his law into contempt through this spurious Sabbath, through Sunday worship, through Sunday sacredness? How is that bringing God's law into contempt? What does James 2.10 say? What does James 2.10 say? If we break the law in one point, we're guilty of breaking the law in, it, in, in all of them. You bring it into contempt. See, Satan knows the truth. He knows the truth. So he just wants you to mess up on one thing, and he got you. And, and, and what is the breaking of the law defined as? What's the transgression of the law defined as? Sin. So if he can cause you to break one of the precepts of Jehovah, you are in sin. And if sin reigns in you, can you be saved? Satan knows that. That's why he is through the man of sin elevating Sunday worship, Sunday sacredness. If he gets people to do that, they will be in contempt of the law of God. They will be sinners. A lot of people just absolutely hate the thought of the Sabbath, seventh day Sabbath being the Sabbath. And why do they hate that? Because Satan hates it. And I, and I was going to bring that up, but since you brought it up, why is there such a hate? Why, why the fourth commandment? Well, how, well, how come he didn't pick on the fifth commandment? Huh? Have you ever, I mean, seriously, just think about it. Why didn't, why didn't Satan make such a big thing over the fifth commandment? Why the fourth? There's a reason. Why do you think the fourth? Well, I, would, I would say the, why the fourth, because the, the fourth, Validates God as being the creator. Amen. Amen. That's the reason that's why. The, it all began with God. Right. And if you, if you take him out the picture, then, then Satan can say, I'm the boss. Now, who is the creator of all things? Jesus. Jesus Christ. There you go. So, he hates Jesus. And the fourth commandment points to Jesus as the creator. Now you're beginning to understand it even more now, right? He hates Jesus. Keep that in mind. Don't ever forget this. Satan hates Jesus. He wants to take him out. He hates you if you're a follower of Christ. He wants to take you out. So this is why he hates the fourth commandment. Because the fourth commandment identifies Jesus Christ as the creator of heaven and earth. Keep on reading here. Listen at this. He says, thus the world will become mine. Did you all hear that? Satan says that if he can get people to worship this spurious Sabbath, this Sunday, first day of the week, he said, if he can do that, the world will be mine. Remember, what does he want? He wants to be worshipped. I will ascend. I want a throne. I want people to worship me like they worship God, like they worship Jesus. I want that worship. Thus the world will be mine. I will be the ruler of the earth, the prince of the world. I will so control the minds under my power. Listen at this. What does Satan say he's going to do? Control what? The mind. What does that word, word control mean? To rule over. To force you. This is Satan, one of his MOs now. Don't ever forget this. Remember, you have to know the enemy. You have to know your enemy. So any power that tries to force you is a power of Satan. And I don't care what garb they come in. They can come wearing a big tiara. 
a, a, a robe that's white. But if he tries to force you, he's of the devil. Because Satan forces. He controls. Amen? Amen? So here he says, I will be the ruler of the earth, prince of the world. I will so control the minds under my power that God's Sabbath shall be a special object of contempt. I will make the observance of the seventh day a sign of disloyalty to the authorities of the earth. I'm going to read that again. I don't think y'all heard that. Satan says, I will make the observance of the seventh day a sign of disloyalty to the authorities of the earth. Do you want to be disloyal to the authorities of the earth? Do you want to be in prison? Listen to this now, because this is where we're headed. Mm -hmm. Satan, he, 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 he he's telling you what he's going to do. I will make the worship of the seventh day to be like you are disloyalty, the authorities of the earth. In other words, you're not being obedient to the laws of the land. But what did the disciples say? We ought to obey God rather than men. Brothers and sisters, this is where we're leading to. This is the whole great controversy. This is the little horn power that we're talking about. This little horn power, the Roman papacy. This is the medium that Satan is using to bring all this into fruition. And we see it taking place today. What, what, what recently took place in the news to this week that was so, I mean, it made the headline. People are still talking about it. What was that? I mean, even if you didn't hear, see the news, you heard other people talking about it. You all don't know what happened this week? No. What happened with one, huh? Say it, somebody, say it. Justice retired. Justice Anthony is retiring from the Supreme Court. But why is this such a major news event? Judges come, they go. Why is this, why is this such a big thing? The one who's retiring, he on most decisions, had the swing vote. There's nine Supreme Court justices. And just recently, over the, the unions that came to the Supreme Court, it was a 5-4 split, which did not favor the unions. But he held the key swing vote. And he always went along with the side of the liberals. That's why we have Roe B, Ro B versus Wade. The abortion law that, 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 that said that abortion is the right of choice. 5-4. He held the swing vote. But now he's gone. And let me ask a question. So who appoints Supreme Court justices? The president of the United States. You and I don't have a choice in this. It's whoever they decide. And who's the president of the United States? Okay. And what is President Trump? What party affili affiliation is he? And what is the party of the Republicans? What's their whole platform based on? It's a conservative platform. Right? It's not liberal. It's conservative. So now, what do you think is going to happen to this big 1973 decision about abortion? What do you think is going to happen if he appoints a conservative judge now in this swing vote? What do you think is going to happen if this case comes back up to the Supreme Court about abortion? It's going to be out the window. Can't you see how now your freedoms are going to be 
restricted now. Your freedoms are going to about to be stripped. Because the majority of the Supreme Court is going to be conservative now. And more than that, the majority of Supreme Court justices, what denomination are they? Roman Catholic. And not only that, those individuals that he has to choose from, and I think it was at 1.25, but I heard he narrowed it down to five. Two of them went to Notre Dame. What institution is Notre Dame? The Catholic institution. One of them went to Georgetown University. What, 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 what institution is Georgetown? Jesuit infested. So brothers and sisters, what I just read that Satan said he's going to do, you can see it taking place today in our day. It's happening right before your eyes. Your freedom's about to be stripped away. And what are we doing? What are we doing? Most of us, we have our heads in the sand. We don't even see what's coming. That's why it says this is going to be like it's going to come like an overwhelming surprise. Brothers and sisters, we need to wake up. Things are taking place in rapid succession. A lot of things that are taking place, it just goes over our head. But we don't see the significance of it. So let me ask you a question. What if that comes before the court, a decision to be ruled versus the rights of religion. How do you think they're going to go? Along with the conservative agenda. And what is the conservative agenda? The majority of them are made up of evangelicals. Evangelicals. And this group is the one that makes up President Trump's Religious Advisory Council. These are the ones who are speaking to him. There was some, you, you all remember Hurricane Harvey last summer that just devastated the Houston area? The Religious Advisory Council, President Trump came out, and, I, and I, this is something, again, that went way over people's heads. We're going to have, now this was on a Thursday. I never forget. This was on, this was on a Thursday. We're going to have a day of prayer to pray for the people, the hurricane victims in Houston. And we're going to have this day of prayer. Now, this was a Thursday he said this. We're going to have this day of prayer because... They need, they need prayer. We're going to have this day of prayer on Sunday. Now let me ask you a question. If you needed, if you were in an emergency and you needed prayer now, why are you going to wait till Sunday? Why not have a, at least he could have said we'll have a day of prayer tomorrow, which would have been a Friday. Why wait till Sunday? Who's speaking in his ear? The evangelicals. What day that are, are they promoting? Sunday. Sunday worship. So everything that they speak to him, he does. This is where we are. And now the Supreme Court is going to be majority conservative. Things are happening in rapid succession. Our Freedoms are being taken away. And all of this in the sign of being loyal. But they're going to make it seem like, because church and state, right down here, this is where we are. Remember the feet in the, in the image? Iron and clay, this is church and state. Craft. This is where we are. Church and state. So who is the church? The apostate Protestants of today. And I say apostate. What does apostasy mean? To fall away from the truth, right? 
you've apostatized. So they're called apostate Protestants because they fell away from what they actually taught. That was to protest Rome. So now the churches of today are called, in the United States, are called apostate Protestants. So the apostate Protestants are going to make it seem like you're being disloyal to the law of God. Because remember, church is saying that, hey, we need to get back to God. But you who are being loyal to the seventh day Sabbath are not going to be loyal to, to the authorities of the land. Because we have church and state combined now. So the laws of state is going to be the laws of the church. And who's the one who's leading out? Right here. What's this fourth beast? What's this fourth beast? Rome. Rome. So brothers and sisters, this is where we are. So this subject in Daniel chapter 8, speaking of the vicar of Christ, the little home power. The little home power. Now, I'm going, I'm, I'm about to do a series, I'm going to begin a series, uh, which is entitled Biblical Truths. And I'm going to touch on, which I did in the past, but I think it needs to be done again. I'm going to touch on Daniel chapter 8. Daniel chapter 8 is really tricky. In order to understand Daniel chapter 8, because Daniel chapter 8 talks about the little horn, but the little horn has two phases, right? What are the two phases of the little horn? Come on. Yeah, you, that's right. Paganism and what? Yeah. Papal. Pagan phase, papal phase. That's it. But Daniel chapter 8 goes back and forth between pagan and papal. Pagan and papal. And if you don't see that, you'll get misled in understanding what Daniel 8 is really talking about. Many people don't see that the daily in Daniel 8 is paganism. Because when you go through this, when you go through and you read Daniel, Daniel is translated into Hebrew. It's translated from Hebrew. And in the Hebrew language, as in, like, I think, Spanish, French, the he, the, the, those languages have gender associated with it. The English language does not. So, for instance, in the English language, if, if I say he, that denotes what? Masculine. If I say she, that denotes what? What if I say house? What does that denote? But in those languages, it does denote either masculine or feminine. So when you go through Daniel chapter 8, when you start looking at the Hebrew of how it was translated, when it talks about pagan Rome, that's masculine. When it talks about papal Rome, that's feminine. When it talks about the winds in, in Daniel chapter 8, that's feminine. And that helps you understand and get the correct understanding of what Daniel saw in a vision. So I'm going to bring all of this out. And I knew that I didn't have enough time in this particular setting to bring all of this out. But I am going to be doing a, uh, uh, a class that's entitled Biblical Truths. This is one thing I'm going to bring out. And when you understand this, you understand Daniel 8 perfectly. Because there's a lot that's saying that when it talks about the daily in Daniel 8, many people are, think that this is talking about Christ's mediatorial work in a heavenly sanctuary. And that's not true. It's talking about paganism because of the, when you look at the tense, masculine or feminine. So I'm, I'll bring all of that out. But I just wanted to, to, to hit this home about where we are. And when you, in, in, in Daniel 8, it brings it out perfectly because after Greece, when Daniel opens up, it talks about the, the ram and the he-goat. The ram being what? Medo-Persia. The he-goat being who? Greece. And the he-goat smams into the ram. That's the downfall 
of Medo-Persia, and Greece comes up. But then after Alexander dies, his kingdom is divided into four, right? The between the four winds. And then in Daniel 8, it talks about out of one of the winds, which is feminine, comes a little horn. So brothers and sisters, Daniel 8, Daniel 7, Daniel 2, and Daniel 11, if you understand those chapters, it's all dealing with this dream. If you understand that, you will not be deceived. So I'm going to touch on that. And I'm going to take time and we're going to go in detail. And we're going to look at it. Because we all need to understand. Because Satan works to deceive the world. That's his, he wants to deceive you. He has 1 Peter 5, 8. He is as a roaring lion walking about seeking whom he may devour. And the only way he knows to get you and I is to trick us, just like he tricked Eve through deception. That's how he's going to trick the world, through spiritualism, through deception. And they're going to exalt the first day of the week instead of God's seventh day Sabbath. The question is, which side are we going to stand on? Brothers and sisters, there's only two churches. You, you do know that, right? There's only two churches in the world today. There's always only been two churches. Forget about all these denominations that you hear about. There's only two churches. The church of Jesus Christ and the church of Satan. There's only two churches. Question is, what church are you going to choose to be a part of? Under the banner of Christ, or under the banner of Satan. God's seal or Satan's mark. It's only two choices. It's only two choices. But now here's the thing, in closing, here's the thing. Satan is going to make it such a hard thing to be loyal to God. Because if you be loyal to God, you will have every earthly support cut off. So what does that mean? You won't be able to buy food. Cut off. You won't be able to pay your water bill. Cut off. You won't be able to pay your electric bill. Cut off. So if those things are cut off, what are you going to do? And many people are going to yield because they want the necessities of life. And they're going to choose to buy and sell and thus receive the mark of the beast. What we're coming down to, brothers and sisters, is what we're coming down to. And by God's grace, my job is to prepare you and I so that we be not deceived. Don't be so comfortable with air conditioning. Now, I'm kind of glad that our air went out here in the sanctuary. Just kind of gives a little taste of how it's going to be. You're not going to always have the, the comforts of, 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 of air and heat. Brothers and sisters, we're going to be like the Waldenses. We're going to be in caves. So I'm telling you, this is where, it's where we're headed. And we see the events that took place this week that let it, lets us know where we're headed. Our freedoms are about to be stripped. And it's coming soon. So let us be, let us be on guard. And in closing, just this one point I want to say, and I'm going to pray, and we're going to close. And I'm going to bring out this quote. I'll show you, but I, I can't remember where it is. In order for there to be a national Sunday law passed here in the United States, there has to be, because Sister White said it's going to come from the people. They're going to demand their leaders to pass this law. So things are going to have to be so bad that they're going to have to push Congress push the president to enact a law. So things are going to, people are going to lose their pension. I'm talking about an economic crisis. People are going to be hurting. Storms are going to just wreak havoc on people. All this is going to, just like Job, hit this nation at one time. 
from all different facts. And people are going to be so demanding. Y'all got to do something. And we saw this take place just a week and a half ago about this immigration thing, the border crisis. President Trump said he, he never yields. We're going we're gonna to continue to strip. You come over here illegally, we're going to take your children from you. And he was not bending on that. The Republican Party was not bending on that. But such an uproar started. Did you all see all of that? I mean, all over the world, world leaders, there was such a huge uproar. And what happened? He changed his mind. Why? Because of what take the grassroots, the people. That's how he's going to move the Sunday law. The Lord just showed us what's coming. Things are going to have to be so bad that people are going to demand that, hey, we need to get back to God. And the evangelicals who are talking in his ear promote Sunday. Let's get back, get people back going to church. That's going to stay the hand of God. And all these judgments will stop. That's coming. That's coming. And we just got a taste of it. Brothers and sisters, we need to get ready. We need to get ready spiritually. Don't forget about physical. We need to be ready spiritually so that we will not be moved. Because those who are sealed are those who are settled into the faith spiritually, intellectually, and spiritually. Intellectually means you have a knowledge of it, but spiritually means that you have an experience with it. Amen? Amen. This is how we're going to be sealed with the seal of God. So it's a spiritual preparation that you and I need today. And by God's grace, we're going to get it. Let us pray. Father in heaven, thank you so much for your word. Thank you so much for truth. Thank you so much for knowledge regarding the end times, times in which we're living. Lord, we ask that you would continue just to be with us, strengthen us throughout the rest of this service as we continue to worship thee in spirit and in truth. We pray this prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.